welcome back. And today we're right back on the Wang Rider. And in the previous episode, you guys came out swinging with the puns and some of them were properly top tier. Uh, some of them genuinely had me laughing out loud. So if you're, if you're just joining us on episode two here and you haven't seen episode one, go back and check out episode one and hop on down into the comments because some of the puns down there are really, they're really pretty good. <laughs> some of them were, were properly hilarious. So thank you guys for that. But where we left off in the previous episode, things weren't quite working right. We had some semblance of life out of the machine. We, we got something to show up on the, the, the screen. It didn't look right. There was a lot wrong with it. Uh, and well, I thought that maybe the Z80 CPU PIO and CTC chip were going to be causing us issues because there was a ton of corrosion on the pins. Uh, and well, that's just because Mostec probably used a different material to make the pins than the material that the sockets were made out of. And anytime you have two pieces of metal touching each other that are dissimilar metals, there's going to be corrosion showing up there. Uh, and they were really gross looking. But well, I've done quite a lot of work since that last episode and things have improved dramatically. So what I want to show you guys today is, well, that journey of getting to the point where I actually consider this machine to be alive, even though we're still missing the system disk. There is a lot of really fantastic stuff we've discovered about it. So let's hop over to the bench. I'll show you where we left off, and then we'll go through that journey of getting up to where we are right now. We left off in the previous episode with things not quite working right. I'll go ahead and flip the power on here. Uh, and once it warms up, we should see essentially what we were seeing last time on the CRT here. It should be essentially a bright green phosphor that looks really unhealthy. Uh, but CRTs, like everything, take a little bit of time to warm up. And well, yeah, there we go. Uh, so we can see we've got this square box that's our beautiful green phosphor, but I had to crank the uh, brightness way up to see anything at all. Uh, and so we can see that we have essentially two big issues going on here. We have a vertical hold issue, which is why I think we're seeing this really uh, strange pattern going on here and that weird flickering. And uh, two, we don't have anything being displayed on the screen. Uh, so the first thing that I did to see if this would get any better was I pulled the CPU board out and I popped those three chips, the Z80 CPU, the Z80 PIO, and the Z80 CTC. I popped them out and then uh, used a bunch of deoxid and a toothbrush on the pins to clean up the pins as much as possible. Then I deoxided the sockets, put it all back together, and well, it was exactly the same. Nothing changed. I was afraid I was going to have to start pulling out the oscilloscope or the uh, logic analyzer, but then I noticed something interesting if I power cycle the machine. When you first turn on the machine, the power from the power supply is also the power for the uh, CRT, and the CRT takes a little while to uh, turn on. So it covers up something really interesting. So check this out. I'll power cycle it real quick. The CRT will already be warm, and so... Look at that, there is junk on the CRT. And if we give it a second here, uh, the junk goes away. And I saw that and I immediately knew that the computer is actually working correctly because the junk that we're seeing on the CRT there is the uh, RAM initializing into a chaotic state. And then the junk going away means that the computer is working well enough to clear out the DRAM for the video circuit. That means that we're getting really deep into the process, but we don't have anything being displayed after that junk goes away. So we're losing the plot somewhere, but in order to get that far to troubleshoot where we're losing it, we need to fix the problems with the monitor here. And well, this is an issue. Trying to adjust it in that fleeting few seconds while there's junk on the screen is going to be extremely aggravating. So I need to get some text showing up on the screen 
continually so I can adjust the CRT to look correctly. But that also means that the computer needs to be working well enough for something to actually be displayed. And I don't have the system disk, so I can't test that. And well, I think it's time to look at the manual because the manual has a little tidbit of information in there that might prove really helpful. This is the training workbook that I received uh, with the system and it's just chock full of awesome information and uh, all sorts of really great illustrations uh, like this lovely photo here of the Wang Rider in use. This is just such an awesome picture to see. If we go to the very next page here, this is what I really want to uh, look at right now is that there are three different types of discs that you can use with the Wang Rider. There is a system disc, which we are missing. There is a training disc, which a lot of very eagle-eyed viewers caught. It's in the back of this manual. I don't know how you guys saw that. Uh, it was maybe on camera, it was maybe in the shot for like 10 frames, uh, and a lot of people caught it right there. But this is uh, just the training disc. There's no actual bootable information anywhere on this disc. But the one that I think can really help us here is actually the archive disc. Uh, and archive discs are not bootable, but if we look at the maintenance manual, which I did not receive, but I think there's an individual out there that may possibly save this entire project of mine because he at one point in time got a Wang Rider as well and he got the maintenance manual with it and went through an insane amount of effort to scan it in and that has been unbelievably helpful. So Rich, thank you so much for all the work you put into building your system. I kind of wish I'd gotten mine a couple years earlier and we could have worked together to get both of ours going. And I really think that uh, you've got the keys to unlocking this whole project. Uh, so I'm looking forward to working with you a little bit more on that. So if we look at the maintenance manual that Rich scanned in, there is a page in there that says, should a mini disc for storing documentation, an archive disc, instead of a system disc be inserted accidentally, a message wrong disc appears on the monitor. This is the way that we can get something displaying on the monitor continually so we can adjust it appropriately. I just need an archive disc. And actually I received a bunch of archive discs with the system, but I didn't show them in the previous episode because they contain a lot of personal information. I'm not talking about what's actually stored on the discs, though I am certain that is extremely personal information, but the labels on the disc have names and all sorts of information that I, I just can't share. But in order to test this uh, wrong disc message appearing on the monitor out, I did take one of the archive discs that I received and I carefully peeled off all the labels on it that had any identifying information and nothing personal should show up if we try to boot with that in the drive. It should just say wrong disc. So let's plug this into the drive and see what the monitor says when we boot it up. All right, here goes nothing. The power is on. I can see the power LED has come on. The fan is spun up. The CRT should be warming up. Oh, I heard the disk drive read. That's, uh, that's a good sign. Oh yeah, check that out. It says, not a system disk restart power up procedure. We have it in about four different places and uh, we have way too much brightness going on. I can actually probably adjust that out if I bring that, oh yeah. Look at that. So we've got the brightness down to normal. We've got something displayed on the screen, which means that all we have to do now is fix the vertical sync issue. And I can do that by removing this little front panel here, which just held on with two uh, Phillips screws that go right in the side here. With those screws out of the way, the front panel slides right off here. And now we have a bunch of potentiometers in here that we can use to adjust uh, different things. This one on the far right here looks like it's the vertical hold. So if I grab it and rotate it, yeah, check that out. And if I over rotate it, I get a vertical hold in the opposite direction. Uh, but right about, oh, I don't know, right about there, I think looks pretty good. Uh, the one next to it, I think is vertical size. 
uh, which can also really mess things up if I go too far on it, but that looks pretty good right there too. Uh, and then the rest of these I think are going to be um, squish. I don't know. I don't know what you call it. The CRT uh, people out there can correct me on that one. Uh, this one is horizontal position, I believe. Um, and then this third one over here is maybe horizontal sink or something. Ooh. But right about there, that looks really pretty good. There's a little bit of fuzziness here in the bottom left, uh, but I don't think that is a horizontal or vertical hold or sink or anything problem. That might just be an artifact of the CRT. But there we go, not a system disk restart power up procedure. The system is working correctly now. That <laughs> is awesome. So this thing, as far as we can test here, is working perfectly. We put an archive disk in the floppy drive, turn the power on, and it says not a system disk restart power up procedure. It's actually sitting here saying that right now. And this means a ton of things have to be working. That Z80 CPU, PIO, CTC, those were totally fine. Everybody in the comments that told me just to clean the pins, you guys were 100% on point, and I'm glad that I did that instead of actually shopping for a uh, new chip because those are working great. Also, the floppy drive seems to be working perfectly as well because the uh, system itself, the bootstrap ROM, doesn't have any of that ASCII text in it. That means that ASCII text has to be on the floppy drive, which also means that our character generation ROM, the really weird, I think it was a 2708 ROM that was on the video board, it's totally fine. It means that all of our uh, video RAM seems to be working correctly. The video board seems to be absolutely perfect. As a matter of fact, I would say from a hardware standpoint, the only unknown at this point is the printer because there's no way we can test that until we get a system disk. And that puts us at an impasse. We don't have a system disk or any of the other options that this machine came with. Now, the manual that I have says it only had a system disk, but later in the Wang writer's life, uh, Wang offered CPM 2.2 for this machine, but I don't have that either. It, if we don't have the software, it's just a very pretty paperweight. But we're not going to let that stop us, are we? I mean, Rich and I have been working together and we've got a lot of feelers out looking for the system disk, and I'm pretty hopeful on some of those, but... Um, you know, we should probably assume that we're never going to find one. And that means that we're going to need to start writing some custom, custom software for this, which is not outside the realm of possibility. I mean, we managed to write custom software for the Centurion, so there's nothing stopping us from writing custom software for this, except for the fact that it's a little bit of a weird layout. And actually, before we can even get that far, we're not even entirely sure how it's talking to the monitor. It's not a, a simple serial RS-232 style communication like the Centurion uses. And there's a lot of uh, really tricky stuff that this machine is actually capable of. So it would be great if we could get an idea of how to write text to the monitor. And well, we have something that is currently writing text to the monitor. So what I really want to see is I want to see that block of code on the archive disk that is writing not a system disk to the CRT up there. So in order to do that, I recently purchased uh, this guy right here, which is a grease weasel. Some very smart people, much smarter than me, have built that plugs into a floppy drive then plugs into your computer, and you can image floppy disks onto your computer as raw hex. And actually, when I bought this, uh, in the box came this uh, custom hand-drawn picture. So uh, thank you so much. <laughs> it's super cute and really awesome. Uh, but I think we can use this to pull the data off of the archive disk. Now, as I said, there's going to be a ton of personal data on there, so I'm not going to show any of that. I'm just looking for the code that prints that to the CRT. So let's plug this into the floppy drive and 
maybe we can get some data off of it. And I'm actually going to use the uh, Wang Rider floppy drive itself. I just need to take the ribbon cable from that floppy drive that goes to the CPU board and plug it into my grease weasel here. And uh, that ribbon cable is this one right back here. Uh, this plug is a little bit in the way here, so we're gonna get it out of the way. Then we'll pull that plug out, plug it directly into our grease weasel. There we go. And I'm actually going to plug this plug right back in because uh, I'm going to use the Wang Rider to power the floppy drive uh, so that way I don't have to power it externally. Um, so essentially I'm just gonna flip the power to the Wang Rider on, plug this into my laptop, and hopefully we can get an image off of the disc that's in there. I've got everything plugged in and uh, in between the takes here, I did some playing around with uh, the Grease Weasel to kind of familiarize myself with it. I'm uh, using a uh, GUI for it called uh, Flux My Fluffy Floppy. Uh, <laughs> I didn't name it. Uh, the, the Grease Weasel itself is just a command line interface and I am not great at that stuff. Uh, so a GUI helps me tremendously and this one seems to work pretty well, but now, obviously the Grease Weasel or this GUI, they weren't built around the idea of somebody using this on a Wang Rider. This is very, very strange, but uh, fortunately we're pretty sure it uses MFM encoding and uh, the manual gave us some pretty good information about how it's all set up here. Um, it turns out that the floppies are uh, 320K uh, formatted and there are 70 tracks, 35 tracks per side. So we know it's double-sided. Um, now the templates up here at the top uh, of my GUI here, none of them really seem to match. So instead of uh, selecting one of those, we're just gonna maybe pick individual uh, selections down here. And we're gonna start with format spec. Um, and it's got a bunch of different formats on here. Uh, I tried a bunch of different ones. This Sega SF7000 down here seems to work the best. Now the cylinders is difficult because as I understand it, the cylinder is uh, the track on both the top and the bottom. Uh, and so it says that there are 70 tracks, 35 per side. So that would mean that there's 35 cylinders. Uh, but I don't have a zero to 35 option on here. Uh, the, the closest I've got is zero to 39. So whatever, we'll just go ahead and select that. Um, the rest of the stuff I'm not really gonna mess with except for retries. If you get it wrong and it has a bunch of retries, it, it doesn't go very smoothly. So I'm just gonna set the retries to one. Uh, and then I'm gonna put the file name as archive disk one, and we're gonna set the format to a .img. I think that's everything now though, so I'm gonna flip the power on to the Wang Rider. Uh, this is going to power up the floppy drive, uh, so the grease weasel isn't trying to power it, but the Wang Rider itself is not gonna boot because, well, it doesn't have any control over the floppy itself. And I'm gonna go ahead and click read down here. And, uh, yeah, yeah, there it goes. It looks like it's working. It says track 0, 0.0, track 0 0.1, 16 out of 16 sectors from raw flux. Uh, man, we're already all the way up to track 10 and uh, there's only 35 tracks total. Well, this is gonna count up to 39. Um, it, it seems to be pulling it off. It, I'm not getting any errors. It's counting up smoothly. That's, that's very cool. It looks like it's working perfectly. All right, so we just cut across uh, track 35 and it's still counting, so that that's interesting. Oh, well, hey, there we go. It looks like it finished. Uh, all the dots show that it was a successful read. If it was uh, unsuccessful, it shows a big X. Uh, now, I don't know if it read everything or not, but we can check by checking the file size. Uh, the file is a pure binary file, so whatever the file size is of that file is exactly how big the floppy was. Uh, so if we close out our little command window here and we go back to the desktop, uh, we can see it says archive disk one.img. And if I click the properties on that, 320K. And if we look back at our uh, manual here, it says 320K bytes formatted. I am reasonably confident that we got a full perfect read of that floppy using the grease weasel. That's awesome. Now we just need to take a look at what's inside. Uh, and I'm gonna have to do some chopping because I am expecting a lot of personal information in there. And like I said, I'm only going for a very specific bit of code. Uh, so give me a few minutes to uh, maybe get all the personal information out of there. 
All right, there was way too much personal information in that file. All sorts of stuff that I really shouldn't be seeing and just shouldn't even be sharing. But right at the top, there was a little piece of code that was specifically for writing not a system disk and restart power up procedure uh, to the CRT. And uh, well, I decided to actually go through and uh, try to disassemble that as best as I could. Uh, I have never done anything with a Z80 before. So there's a lot of stuff in here that's probably pretty wrong. Right at the top here, we have our ASCII. It says not a system disk, restart power up procedure. However, once we get below that, we get into the bulk of the code that uh, is going to print that on screen. And uh, the big one is this one right here, which is CD5602. This is a call or a jump subroutine instruction that goes to the address hex 0256. And that's going to be the subroutine that sets everything up in the video. There's a lot of really interesting things in here, but it's actually incredibly simple code. It just loads a value into the A register, and then it outputs that value to a specific port. And without the manual, it would be almost impossible to figure out what those ports are, but uh, Rich coming in clutch again by scanning that manual. There is an appendix in here that has an IO address table, and it's got all of the ports listed. Uh, so for example, we can see that the very first instruction here is to load A with uh, 0x80, and then output that to port 03. Uh, and 03 all the way at the top here is an upper, upper bank select. Uh, and if D7 is zero, it selects the prom. If D7 is one, it selects the CRT. And uh, well, 0x80 here comes out to uh, one zero zero zero, and then four more zeros, which means that D7 is equal to one. And then as we go through here, we have uh, it essentially writing values to different video control ports here. We've got uh, load the horizontal line count, load the sync width delay interface, all sorts of stuff about how to set up the video hardware so that we can print something to the monitor. Now, what this means is that with this code alone, we can maybe start doing some tricky stuff. So yesterday I filmed an entire wrap up to this episode where I said we've got it saying not a system disk. We've taken a look at the code and the possibilities are endless on where we can go from here. And I felt really good about that ending. And I woke up this morning and I went, I can do better. We can do a lot better. Uh, so uh, I did some extra work and check this out. I'm going to flip the power on here. The uh, CRT should be warming up and it's reading the uh, floppy disk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there it goes. It says hello world. Instead of not a system disk restart power procedure, I got it to say something completely different. Uh, and if you're wondering what on earth hello world is, uh, the very first bit of code that we wrote for the Centurion was supposed to be hello world, but when I was punching in the hex into the memory monitor, I made a mistake and I skipped uh, W space uh, O, so it just ended up being hello world. <laughs> I think that is a fantastic new opening message. That's a great first step for everything. I actually have an entire page dedicated to very cool old machines printing out Hello and you can bet your bottom dollar that the Wang is going on that list soon. Now, all I really did was just to change out the ASCII data in the uh, archive image, archive disk image that I took. I just changed it from not a system disk to hello world and then filled everything else with zeros. Uh, and then I fired up the grease weasel, loaded up the correct profiles and managed to write that image back to a disk, pop it in. And so as far as the Wang writer itself is concerned, it loads up that message as if though nothing has changed. It just sends some slightly different ASCII to the terminal, but well, that means that we've got it doing what we want it to do, not what it wants to do. And that is an awesome milestone because <laughs> now the possibilities 
truly are endless. I am still holding out hope that we'll come across a system disk or a CPM disk for this machine at some point in time in the future, especially because getting this printer going is going to be very difficult without those. But, well, we have kicked open the door to potentially getting this machine to do some very cool stuff even if we never come across those so oh man this is <laughs> this is awesome i was like running in circles this morning when i saw it print hello world on the screen <laughs> uh so anyways i want to thank you guys so much for watching and i hope to see you in the next episode